something strange is happening. More people than ever before I draw the pedo. are skinning, shaping and stuffing dead animals. Ew! That's disgusting. There's a global revival in the ancient art of taxidermy. The little mouse smells sold. With a modern twist. A board computer. I want to preserve the beauty in animals and show people that you don't have to go out and kill something. Products are flying off the shelves. 290. Right, 290, we're going. With high street shops popping up, night classes selling out, and demand outstripping supply, I wondered why deceased beasts had suddenly become so sought after. This dog's the biggest one we've ever took in. I went on a mission to meet the people making it. I might give him a cheeky little smile. The business is buying it. I'm happy with it. And the public. Who have found themselves in the strange and surprising world of stuffed animals. I was being driven to a disused Nazi airbase by a Dutchman called Bart. You can see the, the, the buildings over there, and we have a nice stretch of field here where, where we can fly without having eyes on us. In the back of his van, in a box marked fragile, was his dead cat named Orville. One day, Orville got killed by a car here, just around the corner here. But I immediately knew that as soon as we had his body, that I was going to do something with him. I was going to make a point out of his untimely death. There he is, Orville Copter. With a local engineer called Arian, Bart had created the world's first remote-controlled flying dead cat. Every now and then, people get shocked. But that's just occasionally. Yeah. His pussycat had four propellers placed into its paws. And I wanted to know, what kind of man would do this to his own pet? Bart installed solar panels for a living, but it was clear that dead creatures had long been taking up his spare time. I've always been interested in nature and animals and, 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 and everything that lives out there. Death is a natural part of it. We're, we're made of stuff, and if you die, you, you, you end up as stuff, and you can do things to that stuff and to, to, to keep it around. One day, he was just dead in the backyard. Oh, mother's milk. I wanted to make a cheese out of that. Breast milk? Yeah. As in your partner's breast milk? Or... Yeah. I remember when one of my grandmas died that I stood there at the bed and I saw the body of my, of my grandma, the woman that we all loved as kids. But I couldn't resist prodding her. It's like, what does it feel like when you're not here anymore? It was stiff and cold and I wanted to know. Was it difficult cutting up your own pet? I have no problem taking the skin off a cat, even my own cat. After it's dead, it's not a cat anymore. It's just carbon in a shape, a cat shape. Bart invited me into his shed, where it became clear that his cat was not the first animal he'd been trying to make fly, and certainly wasn't his last. It's an ostrich. Having phoned every ostrich farm in the Netherlands, Bart eventually got his hands on one that had died during the cold winter months. It's got a 50 kilo lift and it's 12,000 watts. I was witnessing the world's most famous flightless bird taking to the skies. When I was a kid, I wanted to be an inventor. I'm making things fly that I usually can't. And it's wonderful just to stand outside and all the, the parents with kids, they just gather around and they laugh and they make pictures and they talk about it for two days afterwards. What better thing to do 
that's, that's a very, very good feeling. And I know the ostrich would have wanted it no other way. What Bart and Arian were doing was clearly bizarre, and to some people, even offensive. But they were far from alone. Creations from dead creatures had become popular around the world, from expensive art to eBay auctions. Social media sites with hundreds of thousands of followers were dedicated to the world's weirdest taxidermy. With fashion and interior design pushing the trend, I wondered if death had now become a legitimate business. I travelled to Blackburn, Lancashire. It was here that 24-year-old Nicola Hebson and her boyfriend Pete were opening a shop selling her somewhat curious creations. This is Pedro the pedo. And why does he call him Pedro the pedo? Well, if you zoom into his gaze and his face, he just reminds me of, like, a paedophile. <laughs> this is a fox face mask. You can have it like this, and you can look through the eyes of the fox. This is my favourite. <laughs> that is what? It's a rat crossed with a jackdaw. <laughs> Could I show you the, these frogs? I think they're just having sex and they died. <laughs> It's like the only rat in the village. This is the fortune-telling squirrel. Miranda the mouse. A unicorn rat surrounded by bubbles. And how much is the unicorn rat? And 240 pounds. And how much is the bird? 350 pounds. Trying to look in my freezer. <laughs> this is Sheldon. He's so cute. For the last three years, Nicola had been skinning and stuffing, using only roadkill she'd collected, or animals that had died of natural causes. Where does someone get a dead fox from? Well, people usually ring me at really early times in the morning and say there's a fox on such and such a road. With many of her creations selling online, Nicola's handiwork was becoming increasingly sought after. It's like a memorial to the animal, but it's better than letting it rot away. It just looks like a cute little toy. And I might give him a cheeky little smile. <laughs> that was like some sperm that came out then. Hedgehog sperm. Yeah, it's on the table. <laughs> Please don't put this on the documentary. <laughs> Nicola's business had been handed empty commercial premises by a local council scheme, hoping her creations could put life back onto the high street. <laughs> they now had only a couple of weeks to turn an old shoe shop into her emporium of dreams. Oh, stop it. Being creative with dead creatures was clearly not just a pastime. For more and more people, it was becoming a profession. I travelled to the Essex coast to meet a woman who'd been collecting stuffed animals for over a decade. But behind her suburban terraced facade lay an unexpected hidden world. Most people's perception of a taxidermist, if you speak to the general public, would be old men in flat caps in a shed. I hope to dispel those myths. People say to me, you can't have a dead mouse in your kitchen. I say, well, why not? He's pretty. He's a pretty little mouse. We have the rabbits here ready to be chopped up and the pheasants below. I like to use taxidermy in interior designs. Jane Brown had filled her home with dead animals, except for one. Come here, you. He's just had his dinner. He's the love of my life, this little boy. He's my little son. And everybody asks me that question, you know, and the answer is no, he's not going to be taxidermied. Close your ears, Billy. But, you know, he'll be 19 this year, which is an amazing age for a little doggy. Jane's ambitions had now turned from collecting to creating, and she wanted to transform herself into a professional taxidermist. So this is the animal drawer. Is that your regular food freezer? That is the regular food freezer. This is the lamb that I'm going to be doing. He's going to become a black 
unicorn foal. Basically turn it into a fantasy animal that looks real. So, yeah, this is going to be a real challenge for me, to be honest. The dream for me is to become a full-time taxidermist and restorer. I'd like him to be sold as an inroad into building the business. Jane's business for over 20 years was selling alcoholic shots in Essex nightclubs. But now, aged 45, she wanted to turn from tequila Jane into taxidermy Jane. People that see me in the nightclubs, they assume that that's all I can do, walk around selling shots. In preparation for her new profession, Jane had put the word out that she was looking for roadkill. And in the small hours, I witnessed a strange deal going down with the nightclub DJ. All right, what have you got for me I will tonight, show then? you. Oh, right. There he is. He is <laughs> <laughs> uh, found at the side of the road. Oh, I assume he'd been run over, yeah. And a baby chicken. I'd found myself in a bizarre world where death was being traded. Having already seen a flying cat and an ejaculating dead hedgehog, I had no idea that things were about to get even stranger. I was exploring the global revival of stuffed dead animals and taxidermy, and I'd found myself in the deep south of America. I was meeting Daniel Ross and his family in Arkansas. This is my youngest son, Christian. Christian's 12. Mason is our middle boy. He's uh, 14. It's normal around here for kids to have guns? Absolutely. I mean, you would be a weird kid if you didn't have a gun. I mean, do you have any friends who don't have guns? No. They don't have guns, uh, not my friend. <laughs> Hunting is a way of life out here. Everybody hunts. There's a need for taxidermy. Daniel's family-run business was home to a new concept revolutionising taxidermy. Having started years earlier making animal trophies for hunters, it was pets that had now become Daniel's speciality. Well, these machines are freeze drying machines and we're just pulling all the moisture out of these animals. I mean, you can see, you can see how big she is, but she just doesn't weigh much at all. I mean, this is what you can expect coming right out of the machine. It's a way of preserving them forever. You're going to keep all their facial characteristics and everything because you're not skinning them out. They have their bones and meat and tissues still in there. They're basically, like, dehydrated. You get some strange requests. This Easter, I had the one lady, she said, please go back and kiss it and hug it and hold it for me for about five minutes to let me know that, that I love it. So I did. <laughs> this dog's a boxer. The biggest one we've ever took in. And he weighed 108 pounds. And he's been in the machine for about four months. And uh, he'll probably be in there for another four weeks. Anything that comes through the store that is freeze dried starts at 725 for a minimum. And then from there, it just depends on the weight of your pets. That big dog, that big mountain dog. He's 90 pounds over the 10 pounds times $49. It's $4,410 just for the 90 pounds. And his eyes are open. So he was $5,235. That's a lot of money for a lot of people. There's a dog that's ready to go in the freeze dryer. So how come the dog's in a basketball shirt? That was his shirt, and his parents wanted him dressed in that shirt when he's freeze-dried, so we always keep up with it. Is preserving your pet not slightly odd? No, I don't think it's odd. I really don't. In my opinion, I mean, I can compare it to, to gays. You know, used to, you know, being gay was a, was a horrible thing. You were ridiculed, you were outcast, and now, if you're gay, hey, you're cool. And so kind of the same thing with the pet preservation, you know? Now that people know it's an option, and uh, it's available, and so it's kind of, now it's, hey, that's kind of cool, you know, keep your pet around forever. Daniel's freeze-drying pet service was so popular, pets were arriving each day by any way possible. Some people do ship their pets through the UPS, and they ship them in Coleman coolers with frozen packs above and below them to keep them frozen. We usually get them 
generally every day. How are you doing today? Good. Yeah. And do you think the, um, the delivery man knows what he's carrying? No. I wanted to meet the people paying so much money to preserve their pets. So I traveled across the state of Arkansas to meet a family in mourning for their pet Dalmatian named Precious. She just began to not eat, you know, and v get very, very painfully thin and weak. And just and, lay around, yeah. yeah and lay around, and, and we knew pretty much that she was going to pass. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we had to prepare ourselves for her passing on. And then I thought, well, gosh, you know, if, if we could save up money, you know, and sort of get ready for something like that, I think that would be great. Yeah. We loved her. We miss right. her. And like Calvin said, you get a big attachment, and it becomes yeah, one attachment. of the family. You know, I have my mother and my dad on the other side. You know, I feel like, in a sense, that, you know, maybe when I pass on, that she'll be there for me. It, it makes dying to me not seem so bad. She's gone, but she's still here. Yeah, we can look at her every day. Yeah. yeah. Precious, yeah. I know, but we're gonna. She's preserved, preserved and so right. we can bring her home. Yeah. We well, her we just can. Yeah. We you want you want me to show you where we're gonna put her? I think we'll put her right down here because that's uh, that's where she laid. She yeah, she's laid. Yeah. Sit down there, and watch her. Mm -hmm. Most of the pets that we do, these people are mid-American. They're your wor average working class. Sometimes it's a strain and a struggle on them financially to be able to do it. And here's the thing. I've got a soft heart. I'll work with them. I'll set them up on payment plans. You know, pay me a little each month. You know, obviously, we've saved up for it. Yeah. A few thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. and, and so where we would have maybe taken a vacation or something, we kind of said no. and and just kept putting money aside. After finessing the freeze-dried pets, Daniel had a unique way of revealing them to their grieving owners. I do like to cover up the pets before we show them to the customer. That way, when they first come in, you know, they're not, they're not uh, distracted by seeing them. And it's a good way to judge their first reaction. Well, she's right here behind us, and I've uh, got her covered up. Okay. Little precious. She was special, so. Get ready, here she is. Oh. She's so beautiful. Yes. She is. Look at her toenails. She looks so healthy, doesn't she? It's so ex it's... I mean, she was a... Uh, my best friend. When you lose an animal, especially for me, because I'm still single, and um, when you don't have a family of your own and you've grown with somebody like that, it's difficult to lose them. It's like, it's like we have her back, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I think Precious looks precious again. Mm -hmm. yeah. You did such a great job, and we're yeah, so grateful did. to you. And you have preserved a memory for us. Yeah. And yeah. are you glad we did it, Calvin? Yes, uh-huh, yes. If I were you, and I might would put a couple of mothballs mm -hmm. just to keep any mice or anything like that away. Well, who's gonna carry her? You'll realize she's a whole lot lighter now. I'm just so proud of her. She's so pretty. I'd witnessed the future of pet preservation but I was still struggling to understand why so many people were making and buying ornaments made from dead animals. Hello. With most of Jane's living space taken up by deceased creatures, I wanted to know when her obsession had started. She was taking me upstairs into what she called her jungle room. This chap here, Aslan, as I like to call him, is what really got me involved and interested in the taxidermy. My mum passed away, she left me a little bit of money, and I decided to buy something that was 
going to be unusual that I could remember her by and something I would love. And I just had to have him. I just look at the line now and, and it just reminds me of my mother. From him, my love of taxidermy sprung up and then I decided to try and find a few more pieces. And where does the interest come from in actually doing it? My father was going to be a doctor. He was trained to be a doctor, but was hit on the head with a cricket ball and uh, had a massive brain hemorrhage. So that type of thing has obviously come through me as well. What does your boyfriend <clears throat> think? He's got no choice, really. He'll end up in a jar, <laughs> if he doesn't agree. It wouldn't be for me. I, I wouldn't be buying it myself, no. Certainly, it's not for everybody. It's like pet cemetery in this house anyway, so... Uh, but a third of the freezers for her items that she's going to be doing work on. The process is not quite such a, a pleasant thing to, to sort of witness. Here we go. Jane was starting the process on an ambitious new project, turning a dead lamb into a unicorn. Right. She hoped it would sell for hundreds of pounds and cement her name in the taxidermy world. I'm the sort of person that once it's dead, it's dead. That's it. Piece of meat, you know. The pleasure I'm going to get is putting him back together and making him look gorgeous. And it's a sense of achievement. And uh, people pay good money for something that you make. It's, it's quite flattering, isn't it? Why do you think this is becoming so popular? It's very fashionable at the moment. And also, the other thing about taxidermy is it's very hands-on. It takes you right back to the basics of having to skin something. What I'll probably do is get rid of the testicles altogether. Ooh, we've got a bit of blood there. Cut through the penis. Do a lot of people use cheese knives? Um, I don't know what they use, but I thought that might be quite good for scraping the fat off. Do you ever want to be a mum? Well, I'm a mum to animals, to my poodle I'm a mum. But, no, I have to be honest with you, I don't like human babies. They just don't do it for me. Do you like animals more than humans? Yes, I suppose I do, really. In the nightclubs, I'm meeting all the humans when they're drunk and foul-mouthed and, uh, you know, so I definitely prefer animals. <laughs> oh, Billy, you've made your bed all wet. I was heading back to Holland. Bart and Arian had told me about a new project sending an animal skywards. But this time, instead of propellers, they were using a jetpack. It's not Jaws. It's a young white-tip reef shark. It's going to have two engines, probably on its back somewhere, or maybe right through, like a tube. Then it could fly with open mouth. Air-powered, 120 kilometers an hour, flying shark. Why do you do this? Just because it's possible and because it's funny. There's not much philosophy behind it. Some people really get offended by it, but I can only ignore them because they're activists and they activate all the time. Ah, it smells like asshole pizza. Arian had been sourcing jet engines to attach to the shark. That's one smelly shark. I think this is going to be what it will look like in the end. That is a wind machine, man. Yeah, and then these are not too good engines, so I want something definitely with more power for in the shark. Me too. Yeah, yeah. More power is more better. What are you picturing in your head when you imagine the flying shark? I picture a sunny day, a nice big field, quite some people, and a flying shark, which will not crash. <laughs> It is a bit like Frankenstein, this. Creating new life out of old ones, combining some, making it bloody fly. That's the only fault Frankenstein made, that he didn't make the thing fly. Have you heard the English word bonkers? Yeah. You think this is completely bonkers? I was exploring the revival of stuffed animals and taxidermy. I'd returned to Blackburn, when Nicola and her boyfriend Pete were putting the finishing touches to the shop before the launch party. Well, last night, it kind of just dawned on me that, oh, my God, I'm actually opening the shop. I'm looking forward to tonight, seeing people look at it for the first time. We've had a lot of people looking in the windows and that, and they seem interested. I don't get it. I don't get it, do you? I don't get it. 
Who's going to go in that? Seriously? That's disgusting. Is it a pound shot? <laughs> or a Greg's? No, that's what people in Blackburn want. Pound shots and Greg's. Are you not worried? No. What's there to be worried about? <laughs> it will go well. So there's like five bottles of vodka in there. <laughs> I hired a dwarf to come and serve drinks, and my friend's DJing. Well, I was wondering how many people were going to turn up. I was not really expecting this many people. Ladies. Despite some local scepticism, there did seem to be a demand for the dead creations. Basically, I've uh, chosen the, the boat with the mice. I mean, it's a fantastic piece. It just looks awesome. I want to preserve the beauty in animals and show people that you don't have to go out and kill something in order to do so. When I was younger, I used to think that I was like the mother of all the insects and I'd pick up the slugs and put them in my mouth to clean them. God, there's so many people here. When I first started doing taxidermy, everyone thought I was a complete weirdo and now just having people I appreciate what I do when I'm my wavelength. It's really beautiful, so I just love you all so much. <laughs> Having seen the demand there was for Nicola's creations, I wanted to talk to the people who were buying and commissioning taxidermy to try to understand why. I'd found myself in a van on the Yorkshire Dales meeting with a contract killer. He was squeaking at a wild stoat. I can sometimes squeak him back out again. Mark was a pest controller in Yorkshire, considered by many as the best mole catcher from Coverdale to Wensleydale. These are all traps on this farm here. So as the farmer's driving around, they can see number of moles that's being caught. This is my office every day, you know, it's, it's just phenomenal. My job is basically to kill the animal. It is a necessary evil. They do that much damage and they cause that much loss to farmers and, and things like that, that they need to be kept in check. And some people say, well, nature will create its own balance, but nature's cruel and nature won't create a balance. Two in this one. Nature will allow suffering, nature will allow disease and starvation and things like that. I'd been told Mark had trapped an extremely rare beast. There he is. And was now discussing ways to preserve it forever. They reckon that there are about one in 100,000 is a chance of catching a white mole. I was hoping to get it mounted, not just a regular mount, you know, the old sort of fashion taxidermy. I want it to be sort of quite an anthropomorphic mount. Why do you want the taxidermy? I like the animals and it, it, it's, a, it's like a memento, it's, you know, of the animal itself. It's something that they don't readily know about. You see the mole hills everywhere, but it's very rare that you'd see a mole wandering about. Hi, is that Jane? Well, I've got an albino mole that I've trapped. I was thinking along the lines of Indiana Jones when I sort of came up with the idea. You know, that sort of scene, him just sort of wielding this, this sword in his hand. Yeah, try and keep him as natural as possible. Yeah, right, well, do. I'll get this packaged up and uh, I'll get it sent down to you then. Next day delivery. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. The albino mole was not the only potential commission for Jane's new business. Oh, hello there, Jake. Nice to meet you. I'm Jane. Come on in. Hello, nice how, to meet how you. Do you do? I'm very well. Come through. And who's this little dumpling in here then? Well, yeah, uh, Poppy. Yes, oh, I can hear her. Bless her heart. Poppy is 15 this year. Hello, sweetie. Jake's elderly cat was very much still alive, but he was planning ahead and wanted to discuss what could be made from her once she died. Well, it was just a, a whim that I had about sort of upon their 
demise a way of sort of remembering them. Yeah. And um, my first thought was the pair of gloves. You have the, the creature still alive sitting here, yeah. which um, is very unusual, I have to say. Because obviously... Well, it was just a thought, and then the more right. I thought about it, I yeah. thought, actually, it's not necessarily a bad idea. Why the gloves are not, say, perhaps have the animal sitting in a nice curled-up pose complete? No. It's... It, it, it doesn't seem... It would just be a, you know, a pale imitation of, it, of its former self. Why, why gloves? Gloves was just a size thing, I think. Just what, what could one make out of a... You could have a scarf, a hat or gloves. I did bring along this hat. One could make sort of hat similar to that. I would say the hat would be better. The gloves might yeah. split down the fingers where you're oh, using mate. them all the time. Think of wearing tear of a normal pair of gloves. Could one make two pairs of gloves? It's hard without her stretching out. She's 19 inches long. About 20 inches round, looking at her like this. When the time comes, put her in the freezer. Yes. Um, then you can contact me and we, and we can sort of take it from there. Yeah. Well, I we'll look forward to hearing from you. OK. Thank take you care. Thank you very Oops. much indeed. Bye-bye, then. Toodaloo. Mind on the door. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Bye -bye. Come on, mate. You look a bit displaced there, Womble. On your bed, then. Good boy. How was that? Um, unusual to say the least. I mean, he obviously seems extremely certain of what he wants done, but it's not something to be taken lightly. But what the client wants, the client gets. It seemed the world of taxidermy was often about keeping memories alive, be it a unique memorial to a pet or a memento of the moment you caught a rare mole. And in the States, Making memories concrete was already big business thanks to Daniel's freeze-drying technique. In Arkansas, Holly had recently lost her pet cat, Sam. Right there by the mailbox is where he was found. And then I heard the children just screaming, Mama, Mama, Mama. And when I came out, he was laying. He had been ran over in the head. So it was pretty traumatic for all of us to see. To explain it to my child was so hard. I laid down at night and it broke my heart as well. A few years after we had him, probably when he was four, I had cancer. So he laid in bed with me. He, like, cried if I was sick. He he really attached himself to me. Anybody that thinks the animal's just an animal, they don't relate to people, that's just so wrong, because he would even, like, come up by my chest and at, at really, really sick times after chemo and radiation, he would, like, lightly paw my face just to touch me. And he, they can sense when someone's hurt or sick. Daniel had been working on Holly's cat for five months, and it was one of his most challenging ever jobs. His head was absolutely flat. His eyes were bulged out of his head, and uh, it was really, really squished. But I knew Holly was really upset. She loved her cat and begged me, please, you know, just give it a try. And I said, I don't know that I, I don't know that I can. I'm not gonna make any promises. You know, we'll see what we can do. Today is the day that I get to go pick Sam up. So I'm, I'm very excited, a little nervous to see because he had such extensive damage so I can bring him home. If you're ready, we'll, we'll go out here and have a look. I'm excited. Every pet is its own challenge, right. and he was definitely a challenge. Oh, my God. Does that look like what you remembered him? Oh my gosh, how did you do that? Well, I don't know if you want to hear all the details on how it happened, but nevertheless, it happened. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. Wow. And this is, wow. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome.
even though I know he's, he's not there, you know, it will kind of fill a void for me. It really will. This is just amazing. Everybody's different, and for some people, that's just the comfort that they need. You know, who am I or you or anybody else to judge somebody for what makes them feel good? In Essex, Jane was dealing with an unexpected death at home after the health of her dog, Billy, suddenly deteriorated. He went downhill when I had to make the decision to, to let him go. He was put to sleep. Vince had to take him into the vets. Vince had to ring the vets. I couldn't, I could not, I just couldn't do it. And I could not bring him back here either. And you told me you'd never taxidermy Billy. Yeah, I always said I would never do Billy. To have him back here in the garden, every time I went out there or thinking about him, I can't move forward. I'm the same, I was the same with my parents. You know, I went to my dad's funeral and, and the stone setting, and I've never been back since. But I was broken. See, see, help get up. Yeah, he was. He was for 18 and a half years. He was my child, and um, that's why I'm not having any more. It's too upsetting. I can't do it. I can't do it anymore. It's too upsetting um, when they go. Yeah, excuse me, I'll just get a tissue. I'd returned to Holland for the final time. After months of work, Bart and Arian had told me that the world's first jet-powered shark was ready to fly. Where do you want it, Arian? Over here, please. This is Shark Jet on the first day of his uh, eternal life. As far as I know, no real shark has flown before. What I'm going to assemble here is a catapult to launch the shark. Similar like launching of the V1 during the Second World War. What I'm seeing is like a blur coming by with 130 kilometers an hour. No problem. That's going to happen. They'd invited a select group of friends and peers to witness the historic event. Woohoo! Maiden shark flight. So we made a crash helmet for it from a, a foam Chinese shark. <laughs> I'm your father, Luke. <laughs> I'd realized that for Bart, this was all about the spectacle. He wanted to create a sense of wonder, like a sort of Dutch Willy Wonka. But instead of chocolate, he used dead animals. OK, now we've got tension. Five, four, three, two, one. one. <laughs> That's pretty much it. The first attempt at a dead flying shark had ended in disaster. I wondered if this was the end for Bart and Arian's obsession with flying dead animals. But what nobody knew is they'd been working on a secret second project. A classmate of my son, he had a rat. This rat had cancer, like, like really bad. So his father contacted us and we said, well, let's do it. This is it. He's very cool. OK, you, you, you look happy. <laughs> Everybody has a live rat. The only one with a flying rat. <laughs> this is this will do. Whoops, the lower motor didn't go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First, have to program. I think the world would become a better place with all my machines. A bit funnier as well. Yeah! <laughs> I 
realized that Bartonarian were never going to stop. As long as they could source dead animals, they'd be making them fly. I'd been looking for a reason, a meaning, some message in their work, but there was none. There's no message. <laughs> you know there's no message. No, that's, not, that's just fun. We do this because we love to do this. So. I won't leave the, this world without a flying shark. We need one in the clouds soaring around, keeping an eye on us. I was in a secluded forest at nightfall. It was here I'd agreed to meet Nicola, as she had something to show me. She'd brought with her a lump of flesh. This is the skinned body of Sheldon the Hedgehog, and I brought him to the woods as an offering. And I was witnessing a curious ritual. But I put flowers around him. It's just a sign of reincarnation. Life surrounding the death. So the cycles just come to an end, and then things can be reborn again. The circle of life is honored. This is Sheldon. And he's got a really funny little penis. <laughs> I'd seen Sheldon the Hedgehog go full circle, from dead frozen animal to product for sale. Do you think it suits him? <laughs> Nicola's shop had now been open for three months and was attracting life back onto Blackburn's High Street. That's nice. That's really nice. How much is that for? Tenner. Yeah, I bet this is the only shop like this for my house. Do you know what I mean? And as well as buying, some people were bringing. You know what they are? The moose from Canada. 1932 they are then. All right, great. Having seen Nicola in the forest, there seemed to be an almost spiritual element as to why she worked with dead animals, no matter how curious her creations. I want to preserve the beauty in animals. In a way, it just makes me feel more connected with nature, because I'm faced with it right in front of me, and I'll be actually getting stuck into like the insides of something that's come from the earth. It's made me realize that you shouldn't be like scared of death because it's just a part of life. I hadn't seen Jane since her dog had died, and I wondered if she'd stopped working on dead animals for a while. But she was throwing herself into work. This is Kelly. She's going to make a fantastic dragon, large bat wings. This one's gone for £45.77. pence. Everything sells. There's nothing that I've um, put on there that hasn't sold. It's all doing really well. It's all sort of um, going in the right direction. And I've also finished the albino mole, holding a stick and holding a shield made of bark and fending off the stoat. Oh, the anticipation, eh? I'm shaking. <laughs> it's only a bit of taxidermy. There it is. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I don't know if there's a, a specific way that she's put it. See, that way around, it, it looks it looks better that way around. It could go on window there, couldn't it? Yeah, I think it's definitely something, every time you look at it, you like it a bit more. Jane had now finished her ambitious flagship project, turning a white lamb into a black unicorn. Oh, hello there. She was taking it to be valued by a professional taxidermy dealer and private collector. It was a naturally black lamb, was it? No, no. He, he started life as a white with brown legs, so I had to dye him, yeah. And you've done it all using traditional methods? Yes. And how uh, did you dye it? With hair dye. Uh, what did you do for the...? Uh... The horn has been handcrafted by me out of uh, a milliput. Oh, that's amazing. I would really like that for my uh, personal collection. Would you? Yeah. At a reasonable well, price. Well, it depends what you would be thinking of offering. 250 I could have one made for less than that. £250, cash, now. 300 you can have him. 
No. No. Two hundred and fifty well, pounds. You're gonna lose him for fifty quid. Make me feel like I've got a bit of a deal. Two ninety. Two ninety. All right, two ninety. We go on. Right, it's got a good Whilst some people were using taxidermy as a way of keeping the past alive, it seemed for Jane it was also about her future. Once you sell something, I suppose you can say that you're professional, and I have that's not the only thing I've sold. The fact that he was really pleased with it and loves it so much has just endorsed the fact that I have done a good job. He's a feather in my cap. My time exploring the bizarre but increasingly ubiquitous world of stuffed animals was coming to an end. It was often a way of freezing time, of having memories made concrete. For others, it was a way of controlling mortality, being creative with decay, of finding balance within life and death. Everyone spoke about their love of nature, despite the fact they were cutting creatures up or buying them dead and stuffed. But death is as much a part of nature as life. And whilst most of us want to ignore it, some people are having a lot of fun playing with it. I'm happy with it. Every time you look at it, you like it a bit more. It'll certainly put burglars off. <laughs> <laughs>